I am reminded that it was approximately four years ago that I attended my last LSSA AGM as a member of council. Coming to the LSSA AGM is like coming home to family and friends. Today, at this auspicious occasion, the annual general meeting of the Law Society of South Africa, a gathering which is appropriately themed, preparing practitioners for change. I'd like to commence my address with a quote from the acclaimed author and business leader, Mr. Anthony de Angelo, who once said, and I quote, become a student of change. It is the only thing that will remain constant. I want to repeat, become a student of change. It is the only thing that will remain constant. Change is a constant that as a society and as a profession, we have no alternative but to accept. I believe we should not only accept, but embrace this change. This quote is appropriate today, especially because of the changes we continue to experience individually and in our personal and professional lives. The last four years, two major developments have affected our profession as and us personally and as legal practitioners. It's been the introduction of the LPA and need I mention the pandemic. The introduction of the LPA was planned and took a number of years, actually decades, before coming into effect with the first council meeting taking office on 1 November 2018. The pandemic on the end end was more of a sudden black swan event that brought the whole world to a standstill. And last night while I was typing this address with my two fingers on my iPad, I googled um, the meaning of black swan and it stated it's a phenomenon or a stopper. Now we have to determine whether it really was a stopper. Recent developments not limited to the aforementioned requires us to be flexible, resilient and open to doing things differently forcing us to be open to the idea of change. The energy challenge, one of many we currently face as a nation, has introduced us to a new normal. I believe that the most of you will agree with me that change, whether big or small, often brings along with it questions. These questions are questions seeking clarity, Questions seeking to fill the gaps. Questions to determine whether the current thinking applied is correct. And possibly questions to help our efforts to resist change. When the LPE was uh, sorry, LPA was introduced, many of us were asking ourselves, how will the future of the legal profession be affected? How will it be regulated? how the LPC would operate and change things, how the law societies would work under the new act. Will there be growth and transformation in the profession? Some of us who were involved in the organized profession for many years, and I can see quite a few familiar faces at the National Forum, the Legal Pr Practice Council, from the beginning experienced many difficult engagements needed and still required for the profession to move forward and for the profession to accept the Legal Practice Act to, and to fully comprehend the purpose thereof. Today, a few years down the line, I'm sure that many of you would agree that there has been a significant change in of direction. I personally persistently drive to encourage an open and transparent process for the workings of the LPC. I am encouraged that many of you continue to engage with us, to raise issues, take up our invitation to play a role in advancing the legal profession. And I want to pause here to compliment the LSSA leadership for having done exactly that. 
As the LPC, it is imperative that we live and ensure the implementation of all 12 objects as detailed in Section 5 of the Act. Whilst the changes brought on by the LPA were at times and may still be difficult, the efflux of time has given us an opportunity, albeit brief, to adjust to these changes. The pandemic, with many other changes we face, gives us an opportunity to reflect. We are forced to review and come up with different ways of practicing our craft and in doing business. Some of us have become more techni technologically savvy and now can give a tip or two on Zoom or Microsoft Teams. The virtual reality in which we are forced to deal with is regret regrettably not the panacea of life or business as it seems. I've had the opportunity to attend two conferences um, one as recent as just about a week ago, where there were 56 countries and one before that where 170 countries gathered. And I personally raised this point that it was agreed and the view expressed that virtual meetings, interactions or court proceedings is cost effective and savings, time saving in the short term. It does, however, not replace the true value and benefits of human interaction, of building relationships, reading body language of the person you are communicating with and negotiating with. If anything, if at all possible, it is advocated that when you do communicate on a virtual platform, that you retain your camera on. All legal practitioners, as legal practitioners, we continue to learn the important lessons of the need to build relationships and to have positive engagements within the profession, key stakeholders, including the public we serve. Last night on the flight over here, I met a gentleman by the name of Mr. Paul McQuana. Now, some of you may know who he is. I did not. Um, I asked him in general discussion um, what he does, and he said he's a businessman, and he says he assists, does some work for state-owned entities. And we, with my size three feet, said, well, I hope it's not ESCOM. Well, he turned out to be the chairperson of ESCOM. Um, Mr. McQuana and I bonded. And as a result, we are now WhatsApping each other, and he has invited us, because I went on a roll as to the challenges the legal profession has, the small practitioner, and the access to justice. So I think we won up on the minister who's going to talk to the minister of electricity. We are going to have lunch with the chairperson of ESCOM, who was quite accommodating and is open to suggestions to see if we can find solutions to the many challenges. I don't know if we're going to solve all problems, but at least we've opened the door there. It could, and this would have not have happened had we not been in a physical setting. It could have been that we were in the aeroplane and the man had nowhere to go. But still, I think we've, that explains that building relationships and being in a physical setting is very important. Another lesson we have learned is about being flexible and what we do and our approach. Can you imagine what would happen if we were not flexible and did not have virtual meetings? Flexibility has been key in us getting some, something out of the last years of the pandemic, and it has certainly helped to a large extent to maintain the integrity of our profession. I guess when we reflect on the lessons we can see that indeed there is truth to the saying that every cloud is a silver lining. I'm sure that beyond individual reflections, many organizations such as the LPC and then the LSSA continue to look for innovative ways to help us further and build the legal profession. We continue to look for the silver lining and I suspect that you will, it will continue to be in the area of adaptation. 
continued adaptation in terms of the uses of technology. This may extend to changes in the working patterns, such as we currently see, where you have virtual consultations and court proceedings conducted online. Perhaps another opportunity we may need to pay more attention to is how we continue to deal with the issues of mental health in the legal profession, and I will delve more into this shortly. I want to further take time to reflect on opportunities that we as the LPC have had in the last year to engage with our international counterparts and discuss challenges within the legal profession globally. What is coming out of these interactions is that the international collaboration can help grow the legal profession and the role players can learn a lot from one another. It is clear from engagements that the staff at the LPC had at the regulators conference that the following has come out from our international counterparts. How do we continue to meet the essential needs of the people we serve. We need to always remember that the legal system and courts provides a service. And as we know, there are many challenges with the master's office, deeds office, and I heard the family advocate, and we can all go ahead. We need to remember that we are dealing often with people who are vulnerable, in a vulnerable situation, therefore there is always an obligation for us to protect our clients. We need to remember that the legal system and the services it provides is about building trust on the system. The legal system is building trust based on the upholding of ethical norms and standards. These engagements also underscored the fact that not just in South Africa, but globally, the landscape of the legal system is changing. As we are introducing the changes, we should not leave behind the members of the public behind those we serve. A lesson learned, for example, is that members of society are not trained in the language of law or the legal jargon. At times when an outcome is not what is expected, there could be a perception of unfairness and a risk of non-compliance to orders or outcomes. At the LPC, we are working very hard to manage expectations and communicating the processes to the people who lodge complaints. Gone are the days we have to be psychic to understand exactly what is communicated to you. We're ensuring that the profession is accessible and easy to understand for those who make use of the profession is for the good of the people to, con excuse me, it is sure that people continue to come to our profession and trust us to solve their problems. I heard earlier that people are going all over except to the legal profession. This is particularly important because of the increasing trend where the public often seeks assistance on other spaces or in individuals that are not legal practitioners. We are seeing an increase on online platforms, and I'm sure you recently heard in abroad where there was an artificial intelligence legal practitioners. Um, people mentioned that they Google how to solve a problem. I had a client where I was going to do a will for them for free, and when we phoned them to come in, they said, no, it's not ne necessary. They downloaded something off the internet. Um, I'm hearing that, which I'm very pleased about, which I've only learned about yesterday, was that there are disruptors such as, and I must write, I wrote this down, GPT-34 and plus, and your mind will be blown away when you hear that later, but that is for a later talk. It is also clear to me that the ethics of legal practitioners will always be under scrutiny. We have seen the issue within the South African context and all realize the importance of ethics. But what came out strongly on our recent engagements were the questions about the role of legal practitioners to participants um, of conflict, whether it is national or international. 
The question also extended to involvement in micro or country specific scenarios such as money laundering, which is becoming more prevalent in society. And we had a lady who was very succinct address us on that. For the LPC, to get the view of stakeholders is an important degree, in, ingredient in the work, but even more important is to continue engaging with the role players like you and everybody else beyond this room. We continue to manage, to deal with and respond with the unique dynamics in the South African context in terms of the LPA. At the same time, if there are new learnings, lessons that should be implemented, we are considering it. Ultimately, we must always center our work around promoting the profession and protecting the public, providing access to a transformed legal system within our country. We continue to place emphasis on the independence of the legal system while ensuring that our oversight work focuses on the conduct of the legal person, not necessarily their title or public reputation or clout. Our goal must be promoting integrity of conduct, transformation and diversification of the sector, improved accountability and fair access to justice by all in our society. Part of the efforts to improve and maintain standards also extends to holding each other accountable when we do not meet the required standards of our prestigious profession. It is unfortunate that in recent times we have seen instances where some of, highly, some of the highly respected practitioners may not have acted with decorum, which is due to the public nature thereof is mistakenly regarded as the norm. Although these are in a few cases, they are often very public. While a lot of these instances are already subject to investigations and disciplinary procedures, it would be remiss of me not to use this opportunity to remind all of us that conducting ourselves in a dignified manner towards the judiciary, the magistracy, and our colleagues and all stakeholders is a vital part of maintaining the integrity and high repute of the profession, ultimately building trust in society. This also important for many legal practitioners. This is also important for many legal practitioners who get appointed to for public office or key roles in business by virtue of their legal background. To remember that. They are ambassadors of the legal profession in every space that they occupy. In my interactions with legal professions, it is mentioned to me that the time, pressures, stress, issues relating to mental health plays a role where a lack of decorum occurs. While we are sensitive to the challenges that may arise as a result of these factors, the profession is required to be aware of these challenges. We must be alert there too. We must accept responsibility for our mental health, just as we expect you to accept responsibility for your physical health. I'm particularly impressed with the system in place with the LSSA and PPS that assists um, practitioners with mental health and I've had a brief discussion outside to see where we can get this program diversified towards getting advocates the same services. One of the gentlemen I spoke to outside said that um, his wife had um, made use of this mental health package and they catered for, and I'm speaking under correction, they catered for first for four and then six lessons and uh, uh, therapy sessions and then it was with motivation it was um, exceeded to 10 therapy sessions so the LSSA is really to be commended for this I urge each one in this room to, uh, in room to increase your own awareness 
around mental health and to ensure that you support others and yourself should this challenge arise. Another challenge I want to briefly flag is the continuous risk of cybercrime. The annual World Economic Forum Global Risk Report mentioned cyber risks as one of that is on the increase and as site has been cited as a high risk for the last five to ten years and is expected to increase due to the fact that we are moving to connecting more online but also the momental increase in digitization globally. It is, is it not time for each firm, if you have not already done so, to assess the risk of cybercrime? I've informally, and I don't know if she's come into the room, discussed this with the CEO and the chairperson of the Fidelity Fund to see if they could get us a quote to see for reduced cybercrime cover in the event that they have economics, economies of scale of numbers to negotiate an affordable tariff for cybercrime. Over and above working to raise awareness on various issues such as cyber risks or even mental health, I want to take this opportunity once again to reiterate the importance of organizations such as the, other, the LSSA and other stakeholders in collaborating and engaging with the LPC around issues of policy and standards of the profession. We always welcome your views and contribution, and I am proud of everyone's input in the recent number of promulgated amendments. As you are aware, um, we are all hoping and holding thumbs, and now I'm looking at Judge Desai, at the imminent problem, a proclamation of Section 41 of the appeal process, and there are other amendments that in works, such as 31.4, where it um, addresses the cancellation or suspension of enrollment to ensure that before council proceeds with a legal practitioner's request to cancel or suspend his or her enrollment, council also receives confirmation that the legal practitioner's admission with the Rye Court has been cancelled. This is to avoid a situation where a person can remove him or herself from the role um, kept by the LPC but remains to be admitted as a legal practitioner. Another amendment is section 25 that was discussed this morning with the minister that deals with the right of appearance of candidate attorneys making provision for the extension of the right of appearance when practical vocational training contract expires in order to continue to appear in a court of law in the interim until the candidate legal practitioner is admitted and enrolled. Um, we had sent this, the previous council had sent this, and I'm looking at Kathleen at the moment, I think, to the minister in 2019, if I'm not mistaken. So I was slightly surprised that the minister was not aware of it. We, I personally undertake to list the amendments still required and to bring it unto the minister's attention once again. Um, the issue of senior status, we also had a meeting with the Department of Justice, and I think it was on the 21st of October 21, where we were under the impression that this matter was addressed. It's uh, another matter we will bring under uh, the Minister's attention. I've got a few more minutes. I'm almost there. And Anthea, before you go, um, I want to thank everybody for the contributions in the legal sector code, but this is something that the credit does not go to this council, and it goes to the previous council, whom many of in the room, and I'd like for them to stand up, and the leader thereof was our former chair, Kathleen, who was the driving force thereof, if she could please stand. Um, I know Krish is here. Don't clap until I've mentioned everybody. Krish is here. Noxolo is here. You must stand. Nolita's running away. Anthea is gone. Clement. Where is Clement? Is there anybody else from council? These are the people that drove it to 
fruition. Anybody else that I've missed from the previous council is now to us to ensure that we ensure that the Minister of Trade and Industry does gazette it. Um, recently, we appeared before the Portfolio Committee, and I'm being told to rush, so I'll quickly, and it was regarding the uh, elections and pro bono and community service. Briefly, pro bono and community service has been uh, crystallized. Uh, it's, as it stands now, it will be 40 hours for us, eight hours for practitioners. The difference is that you can carry it over. Um, there are numerous things, but I'm being very brief, and it is now currently before the NCOP, and hopefully this would be uh, promulgated soon. As I conclude, I wish to remind you of the words of the President, um, Mr. Ramaphosa, during the State of the Nations address in February when he said, and I quote, For we are a nation defined not by the oceans and rivers that form the boundaries of a land. We are not defined by the minerals under our earth, or the spectacular landscape above it. We are not even defined by the languages we speak or the songs we sing or the work we do. We are at our utmost essential a nation defined by hope and resilience. It was hope that sustained our struggle for freedom and it is hope that swells our sails and we steer our country out of the turbulent waters to calmer seas. Even in these trying times of hope, it is hope that sustains and fuels us our determination to overcome um, the greatest of difficulties. Taking the words of the President, my hope is that the challenges we face individually and the profession, that we will be resilient and always act with wisdom. My appeal to you is to be the instrument of change that you want to see. As we continue to reflect on the theme of the AGM, which is preparing practitioners for change, we need to reflect on whether we are having the right conversations and debates for and within the profession. We should be asking ourselves whether we are setting the right examples for the future generations that will take after us, will take up the cudgels after us. We should ensure that our contribution to the profession and our individual roles help to shift shift the needle positively in the growth of the legal pro profession. In conclusion, let us remember that as a legal practitioner, we are not only defined by the law or by our degrees or admissions by, admission by a court to the profession. We are defined by a desire for justice, our termination, determination for all members of society to have access to justice. We are defined by our ethical conduct and we are defined by being the best legal practitioners that we can be. And just before I step down, I want to thank my being and her team at the Law Society, Eunice, Joanne. It has been my absolute pleasure to work with you the last year. And I wish to thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you.